Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss a comment piece in The Telegraph written by Andrew Lillico of the IEA fame, as it uh, perhaps unintentionally explains how exactly the Tories got themselves into the mess they are. The reasons are not those laid out in the article, that's just Brexit level delusions, but Lillico does unwittingly show where the Tories did box themselves in. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So if you imagine a Telegraph reader sympathetic to the Tufton Street propaganda reading this article, and it is intended for those people, then at face value, what they'll get from it is that the Conservative Party are too woke. They got rid of Boris Johnson for no good reason, you know, a bit of cake after all. Then they got rid of Liz Truss because her Conservative agenda scared the Conservative MPs. That replacing Sunak will make no difference because the collective of Tory MPs are simply incapable of selecting and backing a suitable leader. And so the party should just die off so that the right wing can start to choose a credible party to back in the future. That is the thrust of the article. But it contains some wildly delusional nonsense. First of all, it says that Johnson was ousted for having a slice of cake. No, he wasn't. He was ousted because he was crashing the Tory poll rating and was simply incapable of realising that he was doing anything wrong. In fact, this nonsense about the cake is just that. Nobody even believes Johnson ate any cake and certainly was not the focus of any media reporting or even police fines. This whole thing about cake was made up by his supporters. There was no cake. As for the idea that Tory MP should have stuck with Johnson as at least a better option than what they got, they constantly ignore the fact that he was going to be suspended. Johnson was finished. It was just a matter of time. He was going to be suspended. If he'd have tried to sit, he, the recall petition would have succeeded. If he tried to stand in his own seat again, he would have lost it. By ousting him before he was suspended, Tory MPs were simply limiting the damage. Where Lillico is correct is in saying that the wider parliamentary party are incapable of selecting and backing suitable leaders. Sonak, Truss, Mordaunt, all incapable. But there's no point banding about the names of leaders who might have been more credible because a credible agenda would not have been backed by Tory MPs. I keep, I will keep saying until I'm blue in the face, it was impossible to hold that 2019 coalition together. Redwall Tory MPs wanted levelling up and didn't care that taxes would be needed to pay for it. They didn't get it. A new report shows that only 10% of the levelling up funding has even been spent and there are no actual levelling up projects that anyone can point to that are worth pointing at. Levelling up just didn't happen. And so the Tories could not hope to retain the red wall under any leader. But even if they tried, they would annoy the potentially vulnerable seats in their own heartlands, the blue wall. These voters wanted taxes to remain low. They did not want the government helping other parts of the country to catch up to them. They enjoyed being more affluent than others. It was utterly impossible to appease antagonistic needs. As for Liz Truss, Tory MPs did not get rid of her because her conservative values scared them. They supported her budget until about half an hour later when they found out the pound had crashed. They got rid of her weeks later for the same reason they got rid of Johnson, because she was a gift to Labour. But where Lillico does unwittingly point out the real problems the Tories have is when he tries to prove that they're too woke. He says that the wokery runs wild across academia, the civil service and the corporate sector. The last one's a bit odd, because I thought, hang on a minute, conservatives are non-interventionist, aren't they? Is he trying to suggest that the government should be interfering in the private sector and telling corporations how they should run their businesses? Never seems to take long for these charlatans to contradict themselves, does it? He goes on to talk about the rate of public spending and taxation. And this is where Lillico provides an actual window into where the Tories went wrong. It is simply that they came up with failure standards for the government and then fulfilled them. A different government may not be proud of a record high level of taxation, but they wouldn't be bothered if it could boast high levels of public spending. But by the Conservatives' own measure, public spending is bad. The Tories really had a choice. They either had to say that public spending is good and therefore, you know, carry on with the public spending, or they had to keep it low. You can't both say public spending is bad and then raise it to higher levels than existed under the last Labour government, especially when the public don't even see the benefits. 
Such is the inefficiency in the way that this public money is spent. The Tories ended up with no supporters for their spending policies. You know, for those who don't like the high public spending, it's like, well, there's high public spending. And for those who like the high public spending, they're going, but we're not getting any public services out of it. Where's the money going? You know, they're like a business who spends their entire research budget on booze and cakes to keep the staff happy. Not a great return on your investment. And Lillico goes on, but it's all much the same thing. He is suggesting that certain metrics are signs of a badly run country and that those metrics are all very much in evidence now. Now, he's just one gobshite working for an opaquely funded think tank and being platformed by a paper owned by a billionaire who doesn't even live or pay taxes in the UK, right? But Conservative MPs themselves are basically in agreement. It is they who, over a period of 14 years, have spent so long saying what they're against, instead of what they're for, what they're against, that the public have a really clear picture of it now, and every everything that the Tories say they're against, they have delivered. They're against high taxes, got the highest tax rate since just after the war. They're against immigration, we have the highest immigration figures on record. They're against, against criminals getting away with light sentences, we should make be prison for longer. Well, they're releasing prisoners early now because the prisons are full. They're against restrictions on market forces. They've raised trade barriers with our most important market to the rafters. They're against Labour. Labour have a consistent poll lead in excess of 20 points. Everything they're against, they have delivered. And all of this is because the Tories simply didn't sit down and plan any sort of coherent strategy. It is because they are a party of rhetoric. I sometimes criticise some of those on the left for failing to evolve from student level politics of debate, but it's not like many Tories are any better. They just sometimes seem better because the mainstream media covers for them with rather more intelligent operators acting on their behalf. You know, when they ask them a question and get a stupid answer, they just, oh, well, we'll just move on. Or they'll even paraphrase it for them. Oh, I think what you meant to say was this. Oh, yeah, I did mean to say that. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Or they'll just write articles where they basically turn the, the dog's dinner of, of words from MPs into something that sounds plausible. But if you really look at the Tories, where is the evidence that they've ever planned anything? Other than how to asset strip the country, of course. But remember, only so many Tory MPs benefited from that. You know, we're hearing this week about how some Tory MPs want the election to be delayed because they've run up debts and they need a few more months salary to keep them going. These MPs have not personally benefited from the vast sums of public money ending up in private hands, disappearing offshore. They just went along with it, like nodding dogs, without realising that it would neither put a single penny in their pockets, nor even guarantee them their parliamentary seat in the long term. We have a term for these people, useful idiots. And these aren't, these aren't the ones who contributed to anything. They didn't contribute to the Kwarteng mini-budget. They had no say in that. They aren't the ones responsible for the COVID PPE scandal or Partygate. They weren't responsible for the Rwanda plan, which has been of benefit only to Reform UK. The people responsible for all of these policies, as well as many others, which have screwed the country and have now led to the Tories' deep historic unpopularity, they're going to be fine. Quasi Kwarteng, voluntarily stepping down at the election, he'll not be finding trouble, uh, financial trouble later. Same, Dominic Raab, he's already got a better paid job lined up. Boris Johnson is earning millions since leaving Parliament. Rishi Sunak was already richer than Solomon before he entered Parliament and will leave it in much better financial shape. On a smaller scale, same is true of Jeremy Hunt. David Cameron hasn't done too badly for himself. No, not as well as Nick Clegg. All of the architects of what has been a disastrous 14 years, they're all fine. Sailing off into the sunset with a nice glass of bubbly on the go. It's as true in the Conservative Party as anywhere else. It's the actual labourers who get the raw deal. The backbenchers who just nodded along with it all, happily directed into the right lobby by the whips without questioning what it meant for their long-term viability. Not that I'm saying that they should be rebelling. Um, they should perhaps have involved themselves more in the party's policies and should certainly have exercised a bit more caution in the choosing of their leaders. Because... You know, how can you see a political party who delivers everything they say they're against and believe that any thought at all went into their planning? And this is why the time of the election is completely in the air, isn't it? Even now, even when the party faces an existential threat, Tory MPs still refuse to engage with a coherent strategy. Oh, why would we go to the polls now? We're going to get absolutely hammered. It'd be like 1997. Why don't we delay 
and find ourselves like the third largest party in Parliament with like 10 MPs sat with the DUP. Much easier just to give up, it seems. And finally, it's worth pointing out that ultimately this was an article written by the IEA saying that the Conservative Party is beyond saving and should just be allowed to die now. And yet, will Conservative ministers go, oh, the little traitors, I'm going to stop reading your briefing articles now. No, they're going to carry on reading their papers. They're going to carry on going, oh, that makes sense. I'll decide, I'll make a policy based on that. The Conservatives have failed in no small part due to taking the IEA seriously. They still do so, even when the IEA are now saying they should just crawl up into a ball and die now. Oh, yeah, we'll do that later. I'll just read your latest marvellous article. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.